The Japanese Grand Prix is over and Max Verstappen is back to winning ways as Red Bull is crowned the Constructors' Champions once again and Max is now just a few points away from winning the Drivers' Championship. But what did we learn from Suzuka? Well, I'm going to be doing a data analysis from the Japanese Grand Prix. Now, let's get into the video. As usual, I'll be talking about McLaren, Aston Martin, Ferrari, Mercedes and Red Bull later on, so stick around for that. The Japanese Grand Prix today featured a lot of retirements for modern day F1 as only 15 cars reached a chequered flag and Sergio Perez retired from the race twice which is somewhat impressive. But even with that there were a total of 29 on track overtakes which is only an increase of one overtake from last year's race. Tire wear was pretty high at Suzuka today and many drivers had to do multiple stops. The vast majority did a two stop strategy with only Russell and Ocon opting for a one stop strategy and we saw a couple of drivers have to do a three stop instead of a two stop. For the one stoppers it was not the right strategy for them. Tire wear was too high and both Ocon and Russell struggled for pace by the end of the race. Overall in the Grand Prix, there was 43 pit stops which was much higher than I anticipated. Going into the race, I did think it was going to be a straightforward one stop race, but thankfully for us, that was not the case. The fastest lap from the Grand Prix was a 134.183 set by Max Verstappen in the Red Bull. Let's be honest, who else was it going to be at this race? But now though, let's take a look at the midfield and the question is, what teams look good and what teams didn't look so good today? Well, I'm firstly going to say I'm not going to really talk about Williams since both drivers didn't make it very far into the Grand Prix. But with the teams that did make it through the race, what teams were not looking so good? Well, one team that was really struggling for pace, as usual at this point, is the Haas team as both Kevin Magnussen and Nico Hulkenberg were the last two cars that finished the race and Hulkenberg had to do a three stop strategy. When you compare the times of Kevin Magnussen who did two stops to that of Joe Guan Yu in the Alfa Romeo and Liam Lawson in the Alfa Tauri, you can see that the Haas actually did have all right pace when it first moved on to a fresh set of tyres. However, as we've all become all too aware of, when the stints wear on, you can see that the pace of the Haas starts to drop much more aggressively than the rest of the field. It is a shame because if Haas can get on top of their tyre wear, they could have a good midfield car. The team is hoping for upgrades at the United States Grand Prix in Texas and hopefully for them that upgrade can help to fix some of their tyre wear issues. When you look at the fast laps of Kevin Magnussen in the Haas to Joe Guan Yu in the Alfa Romeo, you can see that the Haas actually has some good speed in a straight line. However, Magnussen cannot carry the speed through some of the corners, which is probably down to the fact that Haas is trying to make sure that they can get to the end of the race on their tyres. As mentioned, hopefully up Texas, the upgrades can help sort some of the issues out that they do have with tyre wear, because if they don't, then this is going to be a continued thing for them, probably going into next year as well. Haas didn't have a great race, but what teams in the midfield did have a decent race? Well, one team that did well was the Alpine team, as both Pierre Gasly and Esteban Ocon found themselves finishing in the points. However, that being said, there was some disagreement at the end of the race, as Gasly was instructed on the last lap, to swap places with Ocon, which he was not too happy about. However, their pace was decent, and they were similarly paced to Fernando Alonso in the Aston Martin. And to show how decent the pace was, I brought up the times of Fernando Alonso in the Aston, and also Pierre Gasly in the Alpine. I would have brought up Ocon as well, however, like I said, Ocon was on the one stop, so he definitely struggled for pace towards the end of the race. As you can see, Alonso early on had better pace, but he had to stop early due to starting on the soft tyres and when he did stop initially for hards, he did have better pace, but he got stuck in traffic. And at that point, once he gets stuck in traffic, his pace dips pretty quickly. And after that point, Gasly has better pace. After the second round of stops, Gasly has much better pace than Alonso. However, Gasly, it seems, does have higher tyre wear compared to Fernando, which you would kind of expect with the Aston Martin typically being pretty good on its tyres and Alpine not so good on its tyres from time to time. For Alpine, this race was a strong result for them and this is something for them to build on. However, team orders will not help them and having Gasly move over at the end of the race 
when it didn't really make a big difference is not going to help team morale because Gasly was frankly really annoyed that he had to swap places and it's not going to help the team going forward. I just want to say that if you are enjoying the video, I would greatly appreciate it if you hit the like button and subscribe for more F1 content. I'm on my way to 5k subs and I would really appreciate it if you help me get there. Now though, let's get back to the video and let's talk about the top 5 teams and let's start with McLaren. For McLaren, the Japanese Grand Prix was a fantastic result as both Lando Norris and Oscar Piastri finished the race on the podium. How good was their peso? Well, let's take a look at the times from Max Verstappen, Lando Norris and Oscar Piastri. For McLaren, the pace displayed by them was fairly impressive. In the opening stint, McLaren struggled for most of their pace against Red Bull as Verstappen, as somewhat usual, is dominant due to having better tyre wear. However, after the first round of stops, Norris's pace was much more in line with that of Verstappen. The good thing for McLaren here is that their tyre wear after the first stint is pretty strong, which is impressive given how they were at other races in the year, such as at Budapest when they were really struggling. Piastri couldn't match the race pace of Lando Norris, which is something that we have seen at many other races this year. However, it is a massive positive for him as he finally scored his first podium in F1, and I'm pretty sure it will be the first of many for him. For McLaren, this result was brilliant, and now they are only 50 points behind Aston Martin, and 4th place in the Constructors is becoming a realistic target for them as Aston Martin continued to move backwards, whilst McLaren moved forwards. And speaking of Aston Martin, for them the Japanese Grand Prix was another difficult race, as Lance Stroll failed to finish the Grand Prix, and Fernando Alonso finished the race in 8th place. As Aston Martin are continuing to fall backwards in terms of pace, this was the first time we really heard a frustrated Fernando Alonso on the team radio for Aston Martin. It's something similar to what we heard when he was getting frustrated at Ferrari, McLaren and Alpine. And to show the lack of pace Fernando Alonso had, I've brought up the times of Lewis Hamilton in the Mercedes, Charles Leclerc in the Ferrari and Fernando Alonso in the Aston Martin. Here, you can see that Alonso was lacking pace all race long when compared to the other top teams, which were teams and drivers he was fighting not too long ago. The main thing for Alonso and Aston Martin is the tyre wear, and their pace drop was at least fairly consistent. However, once again, this shows that Aston Martin have gone backwards in terms of pace during this season. For Ferrari, the Japanese Grand Prix was a good race as Charles Leclerc finished the race in 4th place and Carlos Sainz finished the race in 6th place. Both drivers were very clean and very even in terms of pace during the Grand Prix, which is something we've actually seen at quite a lot of races this year. Let's look at the fastest lap from both drivers. Both drivers set their fastest lap on lap 40 of the Grand Prix, but note, neither driver here are using DRS. Sainz does have a higher top speed, but the reason for this could be because Sainz was using more ERS compared to Charles Leclerc. Really, the only parts of the race where there was a large discrepancy in terms of their pace was when Leclerc was behind George Russell from lap 40 to lap 44. That was until Leclerc managed to put a good move around the outside of Russell, and there was nothing really that Leclerc could do otherwise. Neither Ferrari could really do anything about the McLarens in front of them during this Grand Prix. And for Ferrari, this race was a solid result, and now they are only 20 points behind Mercedes. And as things stand, they are getting closer and closer, and should catch Mercedes by the end of the season. For Mercedes, the Japanese Grand Prix was a little bit disappointing as George Russell and the one-stop strategy backfired towards the end of the race as his tyres lost all of its pace. And to show that, I brought up the times of Russell and Hamilton. From these times here, you can see pretty much all race long, Hamilton had the pace over George Russell. However, for Russell, from about lap 45 onwards, you can really see that Russell starts to reach the cliff and run out of grip as his times start to accelerate upwards. For Mercedes, this race was alright. However, relations between the two drivers is starting to reach a new low as Hamilton squeezed Russell going into the spoon curve and during the final part of the race, we saw Russell obeying team orders but not really wanting to do them as at that moment, Mercedes were looking likely to have both drivers finish ahead of signs but instead of that, 
we had one Mercedes driver finish ahead of Sainz. And finally for Red Bull, the race was a tale of two halves, as Max Verstappen once again found himself winning and dominating the Grand Prix. However, Sergio Perez had a disastrous race, and after an incident at the beginning of the race, then having a clumsy incident with Kevin Magnussen, Sergio Perez found himself out of the race. For Perez, this was a complete disaster, and Red Bull are back to winning ways, so it's a little bit interesting how that happened. In Qatar next time, it is likely that Red Bull will once again dominate the race, but Max Verstappen will most likely win the World Drivers' Championship. So, what did we learn from the Japanese Grand Prix? Alpine have bounced back and they had decent pace in the midfield. Ferrari are in a position to finish in second place in the Constructors' Championship, and Mercedes drivers need to sort out their issues before they do get involved in an on-track incident. And finally, Max Verstappen is likely to win the World Championship in Qatar. So, I hope you enjoyed this video, and if you did, as always, comment, leave a like, and subscribe for more F1 content. Thank you all so much for watching.